This will be Laboratory 3, Measurement of Plasma Concentrations. The background information and the instructions are in FOX 2.1. We will make a few changes to the protocol. And what we're going to do is we would measure glucose, cholesterol, and protein in laboratory in someone's blood. So one of the safety precautions that they have when dealing with blood, and it's especially important for those of you that get into a medical field where you might be exposed to this or a dental field, um, is what they call the universal precautions. Basically, the universal precautions say that all material is hazardous and assume it's going to kill you and act appropriately. Uh, you certainly need to wear gloves when working with blood of another individual. Obviously, if you're working with your own blood, you wouldn't need to wear gloves, but uh, those gloves uh, would need to be worn if you're taking blood or handling a blood sample from someone else. To take blood in laboratory, we would use uh, what are called lancets. Uh, generally, we like to use the single-use self-propelled one that have a little uh, spring inside and basically you put a little pressure against someone's finger. We usually take the fingertip blood. Uh, it automatically releases and makes a small hole. They actually come in different size springs and lancets themselves. So you can make bigger or smaller holes. Um, once you did that, then your lancet would be considered a hazardous waste and it would need to go in what we call the sharps container. The sharps container is in the laboratory, it would be any potential uh, hazardous waste that would have body fluid on it, uh, blood, urine, saliva would all be examples of those you may use in lab. Um, because the sharps is expensive to get rid of, we also have a different one in lab that's similar. It's for biohazards, but that's called the softs sometimes. And so in the softs, you would put alcohol wipes that were contaminated or gauze or band-aids or blood typing cards if we were doing that. Um, and so you just have to decide. And, and basically it's a two-part question. So well, I guess multi-part question initially. Um, is it contaminated or possibly contaminated with someone's bodily fluid? If the answer is yes, then it needs to go in some sort of biohazard container. If it's soft, you can put it in what we call the softs. If it's not, it has to go in the sharps, even if it's not soft. I mean, even if it's not sharp, I guess is probably the best way to say it. So you can't put it in the softs if it's a hard plastic container, even though it's not sharp. So that's kind of what it is. If it's not a biohazard, then go in the normal trash or uh, some other receptacle for like, uh, you know, glass or things like that. Uh, whenever we have reusable equipment, uh, sometimes we'll use expensive counters or meters where we have to put blood in and, uh, you know, some of them cost $300. So, you know, they're not one time use thing. So we need to disinfect those between uses. So if you were doing that, you would wear gloves, wash the reusable contaminated equipment, and then use Amphil or diluted Lysol to disinfect that equipment. Um, and so, you know, you would just make sure you wear gloves. And again, the whole uh, universal precaution, be safe. Uh, one of the hardest parts of this lab, and probably the hardest part because it's the first time we do it all semester, is obtaining a proper blood sample. Again, we're going to use little fingertip sticks of blood. Um, and so, generally speaking, in this case, you know, we'd want good bleeders. One of the key to getting fingertip blood, and you can kind of see it right here, all right, one of the keys is you want people to have warm hands. Uh, in laboratory, we actually have a little space heater that we just turn on and you hold your hands up and it warms up and that increases the blood flow to the fingertip. Um, you can put it in your pocket, your armpits, wash with warm water, but that little heater works great. Um, and then you would clean the finger with alcohol. You usually use the non-dominant hand, but it, you know, to be honest, it doesn't matter. Um, 
let the alcohol dry and then give a little prick with the lancet try to stay away from the tip this isn't a great stick here but it's hard to find pictures of this on the internet so um, you want to stay away from the tip or calluses um, and then you let the blood pool and then you touch the end of the capillary tube you can't see it but you need to make sure it's open on the other end if it's not open on the other end then blood won't move up it's called a capillary tube or sometimes called a micro capillary tube uh, because it works by capillary action uh, the cohesion tension of blood moves it up uh, in addition we would use heparinized um, capillary tubes there's two types one is called plain and one is called heparinized. Uh, the plain ones have a blue band by convention, and the heparinized ones have a red band. Um, one of the good things about using the heparinized ones is it prevents blood from clotting. So if it takes you uh, more than a couple seconds to get a blood sample and you're using the plain ones, the blood sample would clot in the tube and you wouldn't be able to, to use the sample. So the heparin works well. The problem with heparin is heparin's a protein. One of the things you're going to measure are proteins. So it can artificially inflate the protein a small amount. Um, if you look at the tubes, you can't even see the heparin though. It's, an, it's a thin powder that uh, coats the inside of the tube. So uh, it doesn't change it much, but it would theoretically um, affect it. Once you fill the tube, and theoretically you'd want to get it mostly full like these, um, they're not extremely long and they don't hold a whole lot of blood. It's usually about 50 microliters per capillary, right? So 50 millionths of a liter. It's not very much blood. But then you're going to uh, seal one in. And the way you seal it is you use what's called Kritoseal. It's just a special clay. And you take it and you shove it in the special clay. And what it does is it caps the one end of the capillary tube so it doesn't leak all right so uh, that's the hardest part and you want to try to fill four complete capillary tubes if possible what we want to do then in, is we want to isolate the uh, cells from the plasma okay? and the cells collectively are called the formed elements uh, most of the formed elements are red blood cells but there's also some white blood cells and platelets there as well so the way you do that is you're going to centrifuge it. So you take the clay end and stick it to the outside corner. And our centrifuge looks similar, but not exactly like this. And uh, it's important to have the, the one end with clay, the other end open. And it's important to have the clay end to the outside. If you don't do that and you put the clay end towards the inside, as this spins, it's going to go ahead and push blood to the outside. Now, one of the things I want to point out, and again, this is in our centrifuge, and it happens in all of them, is look right here. What do you see right here? This nice, oh, yeah, I'll go backwards. This nice, uh, rusty color band that goes around here. What's that from, do you think? Yeah, it's from two things. One, students who put these in backwards, or two, they didn't have a good seal on the clay. And when it comes out, then the movement of the rotor right it moves really really fast the centrifuge and it pushes the heavier objects towards the outside and if there's not a clay plug there then those objects come back out so sort of like you know walk out in your front yard turn on the hose and spin it over your head that's what happens if you don't have a good plug here and so that little rust looking band is actually dried blood all right um, you always want to balance a centrifuge if you can. Now we would have four, so you would have, you know, two here across from each other and then probably two here across from each other uh, to balance it. You'd also want to mark the slot numbers down in case somebody else used uh, the centrifuge as well because you want to know whose blood is who, and you'll see why that's really important in a minute. Um, and then you spin this. Now, because this centrifuge is built literally just to separate blood in these tubes it spins at one rate that's ideal for separating the plasma from the formed elements the cellular portion of blood and you can usually do it in about three to five minutes uh, so you close the lid you turn it on you let it go for usually i let it usually go for five minutes and you come back and what you see looks sort of like this down here 
Uh, you have a clay stopper at the bottom, and that's the white, usually. Right? You have red cells. We'll see later that's called the hematocrit. And then you have a white cell layer, and it's also got platelets in it. That's called the buffy coat sometimes. And then you have this yellowish clear or sometimes red layer. That's the plasma. That's the liquid portion of blood. That's the section we want. Okay, so we want the plasma uh, in, in that section. So it's pretty easy to tell if it's done because if you can see the red cells at one end and the plasma at the other, uh, you're good. The color of the plasma depends on a number of different things. Um, how concentrated is your blood? Um, if, it, if you're dehydrated or uh, blood's really dilute, uh, how much kind of relates to how much water you drink. Also, the, the yellow comes from a pigment called bilirubin. It's actually bilirubinogen um, at this point in time. Uh, but sometimes it becomes red. When it comes red, that's from lysis of blood. And again, this creates a potential problem if your plasma is red and you're doing the protein because the red in the plasma would come from hemoglobin. And I think most of you probably understand from before in other classes, if you remember, that hemoglobin uh, is a pigment inside a red blood cell that carries oxygen. And hemoglobin is indeed a protein. So again, if you lyse the cells and put protein in the plasma and we're measuring the amount of protein in the plasma, that can mess up the number. So it's nice if you don't have to have them lysed. How does you these cells lyse? How, what happens to them? Um, it's usually from somebody squeezing their finger and trying to milk extra blood out by that physical squeezing, then you tend to lyse, lyse cells. So once you pull these out and they look fine, all right, and, and these aren't done by any means, um, these just have uh, volumes of blood that just go a little more than halfway, and that's why the, this is white. It's not spun yet. Um, when you pull these out, what we're going to do is we're going to cut them with a razor blade right here, right above the buffy coat, so all we have are, are plasmas. And in a perfect world, what you do, you have these little tiny small beakers, and you just dump it in the small beaker. That never works. So what we have to do is we have to use a pipette blower, or some people like just to put this in lightly to their lips and gently blow the contents of the plasma into the beaker. So that's why it's essential that you know it's your blood, right? Um, you cannot do that unless you're sure it's your blood. So while that's going on, uh, some of the group would be getting that blood sample and some of the group would be getting ready to set up the whole experiment and so what we'll do is uh, we would have to be able to use micro pipettes uh, micro pipettes are a standard uh, laboratory equipment device and what they do is they allow us to move small amounts of liquid very accurately. Uh, micro pipettes have two stops. So you hold them, and this is a thumb right here. And when you push down to the first stop, you get some resistance. And then you can push down to the second stop, and, and that's all the way down. And so these are designed that for the first stop, Right, you push your thumb down, so you hold this and push your thumb down to the first stop. Put it in whatever liquid you're going to pipette, and it could be the plasma of the blood, or in this case, it looks like it's maybe water or something. Right, so you push down to the first stop and then let it up. And in the micro pipette tip, you'll have whatever value you set it to, and then you put it to wherever you're going to transfer to it. And this time, instead of going to the first stop, you push it all the way down to the second stop while it's in wherever you're going to transfer it. And then keep your thumb down, because if you brought your thumb up, it would suck fluid back into the pipette. We don't want that. Lift it out, and then you would theoretically eject the tip into the sharps or trash can. If you're pipetting water into some reagent, you can put it in the trash unless that reagent was dangerous and the reagents we use aren't dangerous. Um, but if you're pipetting blood, then now that pipette tip is contaminated with blood. Um, it's not a soft, 
and it's not especially sharp, although the tip is a little sharp, um, then it would have to go in the sharps, even though it's not sharp. Because again, it's not soft, it's a biohazard, it has to go in the sharps. So first stop, you pull up from the source. Second stop, you dispense into the target. You have to use a new tip each time, right? Because you don't want to cross contaminate anything as well. So pipetting is a little bit of a, an art, uh, but if you play around with it a few minutes, you probably get the hang of it um, from that. So this is just the exact same thing I just said. It kind of reinforces what we're doing. So what we want to do is uh, we want to prepare everything before we have the samples. Okay, so we're going to use what's called a spectrophotometer, sometimes called a colorimeter. Okay, and the spectrophotometer or spectrophotometer, but most people say spectrophotometer, and because it's a lot, most people just call it a spec. Okay. Um, what the spectrophotometer does is it measures the absorbance of a solution and in this experiment the absorbance of light in a solution is directly proportional to the amount of substance in that solution it's a principle called beer's law because beer was the first scientist to sort of figure that out and we'll use Beer's Law to calculate concentrations once we get all the information we need from this. So in order to get this uh, sample prepared, you're going to fill up these little cuvettes. Now there's different types of cuvettes. In chemistry, you might have used them before. They're typically special glass test tubes. And the problem with them is you can't touch them together. You have to wash them individually. I remember when I was a student, if someone clinked the test tube, the teacher would go nuts and get all mad at everybody. And, you know, the problem is if you're measuring the absorbance of light and you scratch a tube, that's going to change the, uh, the, the absorption of light uh, because of the scratch. So you're supposed to, you know, they were in like these, you know, velvet fur lined containers and all sorts of stuff. So to get around that, we're going to use um, these disposable cuvettes. So they just look like this, a little nice rectangular plastic uh, uh, little holders. They hold, you know, about, you know, two, two and a half, three mil. And they also have lids, which is nice um, if you want to use lids. And so uh, what you're going to do is you would put two mils of the reagent into a cuvette. Okay. A reagent is just a substance that causes a chemical reaction. So for glucose, we would need a glucose reagent, and that would cause reaction to glucose. For protein, we need a protein reagent, and that would cause a reaction with protein. And for cholesterol, we need a cholesterol reagent, and that would cause a reaction with cholesterol. And all the other stuff within that sample wouldn't react because it's not, uh, not compatible with the reagent. So... To make this work, right, you know, uh, the other half of the group would grab an appropriate number of these, depending on what uh, group you were in. Uh, you'd grab four or nine of these and shoot two mLs of reagent into each one of the cuvettes, all right? So we would have micro, not micro, um, automatic pipettes that would shoot the same amount into each one of these. And then when we had all of our samples ready, Okay, all of the samples, we would add 20 microliters of each sample with the micro pipette, that's why we talked about how to use them, into each cuvette. And what I mean by that is, you know, you have, let's say, five cuvettes for glucose, which you would. Then you have a 20 microliter sample that goes into cuvette one, and a different 20 microliter sample that goes into cuvette two, and a different 20 microliter sample that goes into three, and, and so on. The reason we do this, we want to make sure we, we treat each cuvette exactly the same, except for our experimental uh, uh, trial that we're, we're working on, okay? And because these are timed reaction, uh, we want to do what's called in series or, or what they call batch. And the idea is you don't put in any reagent, uh, sorry, any re, uh, thing that's caused reaction in the reagent. So the reagent's fine because the, the reagent is only going to react with that substance. And since the reagent is just exposed to room air, there's no glucose, cholesterol, or protein in room air. So you can put the reagent in, but you can't put anything else in. Um, 
until you're ready. And then once you have all of the samples that you need, and you'll see that for glucose, for instance, it's going to be water, a known amount of glucose we call the standard, the blood sample from someone in class, and then abnormal serum, which is a commercially produced uh, serum sample, and then a normal serum, which is also commercially produced. So uh, we need all five of those things, and then we can add them uh, sequentially, one thing to each cuvette. Then you're going to have to cap them and invert them to mix, and you're going to incubate them at room temperature. And it really depends on which one it is. Uh, there would be, and we're not going to worry about which one do you do for five and which one do you do for ten minutes. But basically, as soon as the first chemical is added, you start the timer, and then you add them, you know, in intervals at just you know your normal pacing. And as soon as the first reagent gets the first sample, uh, theoretically, the reaction could start. Realistically, um, it won't because it's just water and there's no glucose, cholesterol, or protein in water. But as we start to add other uh, samples, then we are going to get those reactions and we need to time those chemical reactions. And you have to wait a minimum amount of time and it'll say, right, sometimes it says, you know, incubate five minutes at room temperature and sometimes it says incubate 10 minutes at room temperature and as long as you wait the minimum time you probably have about an hour um, where it's going to be pretty accurate uh, but you want to measure them all in the same interval so if you measure one after 15 minutes you want to measure the next one the next one the next one after 15 minutes too give or take so when we read it uh, we will look at the spectrophotometer and read what the scale says. It's hard to see on this one because it's so small, but the top part goes left to right. It's linear, okay? So the zero is over here and it goes this way and the hundred's over here and that top line is called percent transmittance. So if half the light gets through, it's 50% transmittance. And if 75% of the light gets through, then it's 75% transmittance and so on. It's, easy to read but we don't care about transmittance what we care about is absorbance there's a couple things to remember about absorbance that make it a little more difficult to read on the spectrophotometer uh, number one uh, absorbance is inversely proportional to transmittance so if we had 75 transmittance right so if only 75 percent of the light got through what happened to the other 25 percent well it got absorbed so that's the absorbance and we're not worried about percentage in absorbance. We're measuring about the actual absorbance. And that's actually measured on a log scale. And so uh, it's taken into account in the bottom, but it's just hard because you got to read it from right to left because it's inversely proportional. And there's a log scale on it. And you, as you start to get down towards the, the high end, because remember it's read right is zero, left is literally infinity. As it starts to get down to that other end, it's hard to tell the difference. And literally, the last two numbers on the spectrophotometer, if you could see them, um, the last one is infinity, and the second to last one is two. And there's a huge difference between two and infinity. So we want to stay away from that, that end if we can possibly uh, do it. And then again, you know, the nice thing is for the disposal, anything with blood, including the normal and abnormal serum, because those are real blood samples, even though commercially prepared, they need to go in the biohazard. But the water and the reagent and, and things that don't have blood in it, those could go into the regular garbage. So for glucose and cholesterol, those groups would get five cuvettes. They would add two mLs of color reagent to each cuvette. And then once they had these five things, they would add 20 microliters of water to one, 20 microliters of standard. That's a known amount of glucose or cholesterol. It shows you the concentrations we typically use in class. There's nothing magic about these except for uh, a couple of things, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, then we'll take the unknown blood sample, put 20 microliters into the third one, and then 20 microliters of the normal serum and 20 microliters of the abnormal serum. So each cuvette gets the same thing, except for a different substance is added. 
So all of the cuvettes at the end are going to have the same exact volume, 2 mils plus 20 microliters. Okay. Now, the standards we use for glucose and cholesterol are sort of interesting. Uh, you could use literally any number you wanted, but it makes sense to use uh, a, a couple things that um, uh, make it a little easier for you to, to figure out what's going on. So the first standard for glucose is 100 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. Now, we haven't talked about it yet, but some of you might know someone who's diabetic. It might be you, even. Uh, or you might work in a field where you deal with people with diabetics. And so one of the things we're going to learn is, well, it's not really exactly okay. It's the lower limit of abnormal glucose. So if you went to the doctors and your glucose said 99, they wouldn't flag it and they wouldn't say anything to you. If you went to the doctors and the glucose said it was 100, they'd call you up and tell you you were pre-diabetic. So um, this is you know, still right on the very edge of normal. Right? And some people consider this the, the lower, the upper limit of normal. So the reason why we use 100 milligrams per deciliter is we expect this physiologically, and it makes it easier to do the calculations. Right? You could theoretically use you know, 92.7, right? but you know, it's much easier to multiply things. You'll see with Beer's Law by values that you know, are here. Uh, cholesterol, someone's cholesterol we expect to be somewhere between 200. Fox says 140 to 250. But 200, it's a normal value. So we try to pick normal values that uh, work pretty well physiologically. Protein is a little different. And in protein, what we would do is we would need nine cuvettes. So you see there's nine here. And it looks very similar. Um, and it is. Uh, we do the blank, right? Uh, it's called the blank because it's just water and reagent, right? So it's the blank. It's got nothing in it. And we're going to use that to um, zero the spectrophotometer. And then we have five standards. Before we had one standard, this time we have five standards. And then you have an unknown plasma, normal serum, abnormal serum, like we had before. So the reason why we have four more tubes is instead of just having one standard, we have four other ones. And it's sort of like um, the reason why you would use multiple standards is it's sort of like why an average would be a better estimate of a number than just a single number, right? So if someone who was doing glucose and screwed up the measurement somehow, right, we would never know. But here, when you do multiple standards and you, let's say you screwed up the four gram per deciliter standard, then it wouldn't look like the other ones. It wouldn't fall in line. Um, so, by doing multiple standards, it's a little more work, but it gives you a, a more accuracy and greater confidence in your data. And so that's why you would want to do multiple standards when you could. And so we just took two, four, six, eight, ten grams per deciliter standard of protein. So in terms of the recorded values, Right, what you would do is uh, you would take the spectrophotometer and you would set it to the correct wavelength. The wavelength is the wavelength of light that is uh, adjusted on the spectrophotometer. The only way to get that and know what that is is to look at the information from the manufacturer of the reagents. So the glucose reagent, for instance, you set at a wavelength of 500. Um, and the only reason I know that is I read the little piece of information that comes with it. And it says, set the spectrophotometer at 500 for this. And the uh, cholesterol is 500 and protein is 550. And what's interesting is, you know, wavelength of light is what gives us color. And so not surprisingly, the protein is very different in terms of color. It's reagent. It's blue. Um, while the cholesterol and glucose are kind of a pinkish orange, so they're similar in, in, in color. So you set the wavelength of light, and then you have to zero the spectrophotometer. And to do that, you use the blank. And basically, when you have this, let's say it's uh, glucose, because it says glucose up here. Glucose standard, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll get the standard second. Let's finish the blank first. Uh, the, the glucose reagent is, is pinkish. So if I add 20 microliters of 
water to 200, sorry, no, it would be uh, <laughs> two, 2 million microliters of reagent, it's not going to change much. So it's still pinkish. And what we have to do, it's called the blank. We use this to set the spectrophotometer. We zero it. All right. And then we just go ahead and, and adjust it to zero. And that basically, it's like tearing a scale. If you have a weighing plate on it, you hit the tear butt and it takes the, the weight of the plate into account and only gives you above the weight. Well, this is the same thing. It, it takes the color of the starting solution and makes that zero. So it's sort of like a tear. Okay. Now, I think most of you probably realize that um, the absorption of light, right, is different given different colors. And as an example, um, if you wear black in the summer, uh, especially you're out in a hot day, it's going to be hotter because black is going to absorb the light. If you wear white, white doesn't absorb light because it's got a different wavelength. So um, we set that blank and then we put in the standard number one. And we don't touch anything and we just read what the absorbance number says. And so for standard one, number one, we put the number that we got off the spectrophotometer here. And since it's a standard, we know what that concentration is. We put that value here. So for glucose, it would be 100 milligrams per deciliter. All right. Then we would put your blood sample in and measure that. And we'd get some number. We don't know what the concentration is yet. All right. And then we do the same thing for normal and abnormal. To get the concentrations for those three samples, we're going to have to calculate that using Beer's Law at the bottom. Okay, so we'll talk about that in the next video. So a couple disposal notes, right? Um, if it's blood, we assume it's hazardous, right? So we try to handle your own. That way it's, you know, less uh, dangerous, but you should always wear gloves. Okay, and again, uh, lancets, sharp and hard materials need to go in the sharps. The soft materials, like a paper towel, we go in, or gauze, um, Maybe you use the alcohol wipe to wipe your finger after you stuck yourself. Those would be biohazards. The reusable equipment, like the test tubes, the beakers, the pipettes. Um, we dispose of the pipette tips, but, you know, as an example, um, the cryto-seal, those clay, little clay racks, those need to be disinfected. Um, and we don't want to throw them away because they're pretty expensive for just being a little bit of clay. Um, and so we'll just make sure that the biohazards get into the biohazard. So we would split groups into subgroups and one part of the group would get blood sample, right? So they would be involved with getting a blood sample. One part of the group would get the reagents set up and, and everything else. And then once we did that, they would add the each substance to each cuvette, incubate it, and then measure it all together on the spectrophotometer. So uh, we'll stop the video here and pick up with the discussion video next.